what they call a second opinion reviewer, which means I get this wonderful opportunity to speak with candidates for the Ashoka Fellowship for generally three to four hours each, just to talk to them about their work and their life histories, and to think about their work in the context of, of Ashoka's criteria for its fellows. Uh, this week we've had an opportunity to meet with really four fascinating candidates, three from Poland, one from the Czech Republic, uh, all of whom are doing fascinating work uh, in different fields. And that's really one of the wonderful things about Ashoka as an institution. It embraces social innovation across every field imaginable. And we run into uh, fellows, uh, men and women, young and old, who have identified some sort of big complex problem and they have been inspired, uh, usually with many other people, to try and address that problem and see what they can do to create a movement that might collectively solve uh, an issue, whether it's in the field of education or human rights or economic development or public health. Uh, or as in the case this week, uh, we had one, one fellow who's working on disabilities issues relating to trying to get uh, people with disabilities to be mainstreamed into the private sector workplace, which has been slow to happen, I understand, in Poland. And we had another fellow who's looking at the difficulty of radicalization right now and seeing that there are common elements in how young people may be radicalized by ideologies that run the gamut, whether it's ideologies among Islamic extremism, ideologies on the far, far left, or ideologies in the far right where nationalist ideologies might turn to violence. He's come up with a fascinating sort of multi-pronged approach where you're working with educators and the police uh, and, and social workers essentially to try and create a safe environment for all citizens and catching young people uh, as they may be first uh, coming into contact with radical elements and being attracted by them and then catching them early enough that they can turn away from that and choose a more productive path in society. So I understand that the question for today is really what kind of common elements I see among social innovators around the world. And that's a big question. You know, there are, there are a number of one, things I can point to. I, I would maybe start with a couple of small observations, which is I think the field of social innovation is changing and changing rapidly now that in the last two to three decades, I think there are far more people who are choosing uh, careers or to dedicate themselves, even uh, if it's not their full-time professional capacity, even in a part-time capacity, but with tremendous fervor, into engaging in society's toughest problems. And I think that that trend of in greater and greater levels of involvement, whether it's in Europe as we are here, in Latin America and Africa, where I spend quite a bit of time, or Asia as well, uh, there has been an awakening to the possibilities of citizen engagement to solve problems. So that's one broad trend I would see. The other trend I, I, I would say that I've seen more of late has been that people who are thinking about problems are increasingly thinking about how do I collaborate with others effectively? That it's no longer the hero of what we once called the, the uh, no longer the narrative, excuse me, of what we once called the, the hero narrative of the isolated social entrepreneur swimming upstream to con confront a particular challenge, which is the role that you see for many people who do advocacy. But right now, it feels to me that many social innovators are figuring how do they link up with other individuals like them, whether or not they're people they know, but people who might care about the issue. How do they link up with institutions, whether they be private sector organizations, companies, whether they be non-governmental organizations, citizen society, civil society organizations, or citizen sector organizations. Just from the get-go, it's about building coalitions to address a problem. That's not to say that leadership isn't still absolutely critically important, but I think the leadership that we see now increasingly is about leadership that recognizes the need to mobilize many, many people to address a problem. And so even the strongest leaders right now, as uh, one of the former Ashoka colleagues from Poland, Richard Kraske says, are, are identifying how distributed leadership is needed, that you need to have leadership that is inspired among many actors. Um, so that's one trend I would point to. I think a couple of other trends um, come, to, come to mind. One I, we've been spotting for years, which is um, you know, people who choose to do this um, usually are, are doing it because they've had their, uh, in their life trajectory, oftentimes in their youth, there is a moment where they are given an opportunity 
to do something that seems significant to them, even if it's in a small way, in a small community, within a school, perhaps within a, a church, within a social group, they, they're given an opportunity to try and make a change in some setting where they realize, wow, I've actually, I can actually make something different. I don't have to always rely on others or that there are institutions that are bigger than me, but there are ways in which I can change the world. And I think that that sense of awakening uh, of the, to the possibility that an individual can make a change um, is something that we see over and over again in the candidates who come through the Ashoka Fellow process. I think we were, you see them in the Changemaker Schools uh, network of people who we find. But what's interesting to me, and has always been interesting to me in, in the context of this part of the world, is that you know, post pre-1989, the areas for citizen action were prescribed somewhat. You could still create change and create positive interactions, but uh, I think there was less of a political and social space to do so. So for the Ashoka Fellows from Eastern Europe who were first elected in the, I would say the first decade and a half, many of them came out of, uh, had come out of the political movement at one point in time. They were involved with solidarity, much the same way as fellows in South Africa had been very much involved with the struggle against apartheid. But now, you know, a couple of decades after those struggles against apartheid or, or, or the solidarity movement, um, you know, we're seeing a whole new class of innovators who've had the opportunities as they were, at when they were young, to, to uh, experiment and learn. And they, frankly, social innovation is taught now in many, many schools. You can read about it in news magazines. You can hear about it on social media right now. So I think people are awakened to the possibility in a way that they haven't been before. But which is not to say sometimes people get awakened much later in life. I think we want to keep in mind that social innovation isn't just for the young. It's for adults. It's for seniors. I mean, there's a tremendous amount that we can all do. And increasingly, you know, we had a wonderful candidate this week um, who came from the Czech Republic who really, I think, wasn't awakened to the power and possibility of, of a social movement until he was a graduate student. Uh, and yet he's doing remarkable work um, fighting essentially corruption and working for government accountability in the procurement system. So that's another example. The remarkable things about social innovation, it comes from you know, all different types of people, all different types of fields. It's not restricted to people who are just in the social sector. You know, there are remarkable social innovators who are coming from the business sector. There are remarkable social innovators who've had some government experience. Oftentimes it's very hard to innovate in larger bureaucracies. So we tend to see people who are doing social innovation working outside of large institutions just because most institutions aren't designed for the entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs start institutions which will then grow, but oftentimes they will leave them because they want the flexibility. And I think the challenge for us today as we work with larger and larger institutions is how do you design institutions to be open to the kind of innovation? In my country, if you want to look at the cycle of innovation in the private sector, oftentimes big companies have to go buy smaller companies in order to identify uh, social innovation that they can then incorporate and, and make a, a mainstream business product. And I think to a certain extent you can see that in the social sector, although there are very few social sector organizations that grow to be larger and larger enterprises. But I want to maybe hit back to the point that, you know, I think we have, you know, social innovation. There, there's not one archetypal personality for a social innovator. So if you are thinking about uh, the issues in your community, in your neighborhood, in your city, in your country, you, you shouldn't be afraid that you, you don't have the, the ability or the guts to do it. Anybody can do this. You just have to dive in and learn. I think the most important thing among social entrepreneurs uh, whom I've met is their ability to fail and then to learn from that. So, you know, that's said over and over again, and it's, so much tr it's almost trite now when we think about business entrepreneurship. The most important thing is failing. But it is very true. You need to be able to learn from your mistakes. If you don't try something or aim for something big, uh, you know, you'll never get anywhere. And there is another thing that I think is a trend to point out to, which is oftentimes, I think social innovators face a tremendous number of obstacles. They face a tremendous number of people uh, who are going to be skeptical of their interests, they're going to be skeptical of their ability to make change, and they're going to be skeptical of their ideas. Because there are some people who look at the world and say, anything that has really been, everything has already been tried, there's really nothing new. If there are problems that have been for around, they're, really, they're problems that we can't solve. 
But in fact, it's really about innovation and creativity. We don't call it social innovation for nothing. That, you know, there isn't any problem that can't be improved on. And it's not that one solves any one problem, because most problems when they get solved, will be, there will be another problem in its way. But it is a process of continual learning and continuous improvement. We can make things better, and we make them better incrementally, and sometimes we make them better in big leaps. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue our efforts regardless of whether it's a small change or a large change at this point in time. Uh, so for all of you who out there might be listening to this, you know, every single one of you can be a social innovator in one way. And if you're not going to come up with the best idea, go hit your, as we say, you know, hit yourself up to somebody who you think has an idea that you share, that you can believe in, that you can contribute to. There's really a broad canvas.